There it is, it's cleared now. We had one question this month that came out of our auditorium class. Uh, turn to Numbers chapter 4. We're going to read verse 6. So out here in the auditorium class, we've been studying through the Law of Moses. Uh, we've been studying the narrative portions. And when we reach Numbers 4, we read some of the duties of the Levites and uh, what, what they're supposed to do with the tabernacle. And as we read Numbers chapter 4, verse 6 together, if you are reading in a translation other than the ESV, tonight's question will become apparent almost immediately. Then they shall put on it a covering of goat skin, and spread on top of that a cloth all of blue, and shall put in its poles. All right, so let's do Q&A Jeopardy. What's the question? <laughs> yes. Now, and you're, you're reading out of the New American Standard, right? Or not uh, the New King James, right? Yeah. You're reading out of the New American Standard. Yeah, you can, you can tell, by the way, what translation somebody is reading out of by how they translate this verse. If it's Badger, it's King James or New King James. If it's Porpoise, uh, it is the New American Standard. If it's Seal, it's the Amer Old American Standard. Uh, if it's Goat Skin, it's either the RSV or the ESV. Uh, in fact, there's, there's a huge variety of translations here. Uh, let's see, yeah, we've got porpoise skin, seal skin, badger skin. Uh, one translation rendered it dolphin skin. There's, we have some, like Dewey Rames, um, that renders it violet skins, which is, that's, that's really different, <laughs> isn't it? Violet skins. We'll see where that comes from in a minute. Um, some of our translations, though, have... Oh, yeah, yeah let's see. There's at least one that uh, calls it a sea cow skin. Um, now, what does that indicate to you whenever you have such a variety of translations? Animals. They don't know what animal are. Yeah, they don't know. Yeah. And this is... Yeah, it's a skin of some kind. Um, but it indicates that there is a great deal of confusion over what kind of skin this is. Uh, and it is mostly a confusion over what kind of animal it is, although it's, it's more than that, too. Now, let me start out with this. Uh, well, well, first off, let's start with the offending word, as it were. Um, the, the, trans or, sorry, the text uh, says that... Uh, let's see. They shall put on it a covering of the skin of the tahash. So it's t het, which is, you know, the, your phlegm sound, and then shin, which is your sh sound. Um, so that is tahash. So that h there, that's the phlegmy h. All right, that's the one where you sound like you're getting up phlegm. Um, and normally I would put a translation over here, but let me begin by telling you that nobody has any idea what tahash is or what tahash means. There's lots of great conjecture about it. Um, there's lots of terrible conjecture about it, too. The plain fact is that nobody living knows what tahash means. Um, and, of course, this is indicated pretty clearly in our translations. This is also indicated in any of the Hebrew lexica that you look up this word in. Right? If you were to look it up in, uh, in Halot or Brown Driver Briggs, or if you were to look it up uh, in more of like a standard English concordance like Strong's, um, most of them indicate actually in the, in the reading for that word that the meaning is uncertain. And then they'll give you their conjecture on what it means. So there's, there's really no answer to the question. So what I want to do instead is I want us to consider how one goes about tackling a question like this. Because this is not the only place 
in the Old Testament uh, where the meaning of a word or a phrase is uncertain and needs some clarifying. Um, now this is, so basically we're going we're gonna to consider our methods. How do you hunt down uh, good ways to clarify what uh, a passage, what a confusing passage in the Old Testament means? What process do you go through? Uh, and Tahash is a pretty good uh, safe case study here because there is not any doctrine that hinges off of Tahash. Right? There's no, there is no division between us and, say, the Baptists or the Presbyterians over what kind of skin was used on the tabernacle. Right? Uh, that's, that's not the source of the division between us and the denominations. Um, and as far as I know, as of yet, there have not been any splits in the churches over the meaning of Tahash. But don't anybody get any ideas or anything? So, uh, let's, let's consider how we tackle this. Because learning how to clarify confusing language like this is going to help you in your study of the Old Testament. So, where are we going to start? We start in the same place every time. Right? Whether it's Tahash or anything else. If, the, if you're reading a passage and you find it confusing... Uh, you let Scripture answer Scripture. So you start looking in other places uh, in the Scriptures, particularly in the Old Testament if you're dealing with an Old Testament issue. Um, you start looking around for other occurrences of that phrase or that word. Um, so in this case, we're in Numbers 4. Uh, this isn't, you know, verse 6 isn't the only place where we see the skin of the Tahash, by the way. There's... I want to say yeah, it occurs again in verse 8, um, possibly, yeah, in verse 10. There are a few places here in chapter 4, maybe again in verse 12. Um, but we don't know what Tahash means in that chapter. So the first question is, well, is it used elsewhere? And how is it used if it's used elsewhere? So we start by doing some searching. And this is not something that you have to be an expert at to do by the way, with some basic, uh, some basic tools. This is something that you guys can do yourselves if you're reading, if you're studying through some part of the Old Testament and you find something that just, you have no idea what it means and you want some other scriptures to kind of help you shed some light on what it might mean. There are all kinds of tools for doing this. Um, and some of them, uh, you, you can... There are some sophisticated tools for doing this, uh, but ultimately you don't need anything more than something like an old standard, you know, Strong's Concordance and a King James Bible, right? Those are really, really easy to get a hold of. In fact, you can use those for free on the internet. Um, there is, let me, let me recommend a resource to you. It is Bible Hub. And I think that's a dot com. Let me look here. Yeah. So if you're on if you're on the internet, Bible Hub, um, besides having the text of the scriptures in it, uh, also has like a complete searchable Strong's Concordance, and it's completely free. All right. So you don't have to go out and spend what the dollar twenty five it would take you to dig through you know and find one at the uh, at a thrift store somewhere. Um, yeah, or, yeah, I mean, we do have some here. I've got one in my office. Um, I don't know if we've got, do we have another one in the resource room as well? So yeah, we've got a couple of the, you know, the big, I mean, they're big baby whale books. The Strong's Concordance. Um, but the Strong's Concordance, if you've never used one, uh, it's based off of the text of the King James. So you look up your passage in the King James. You find the word that you're looking for. You find it in Strong's. Um, and Strong's is going to give you a list of other places in the Scripture where that word is used. It also, it does a really interesting thing. Um, James Strong came up with this set of numbers. It's basically like the Dewey Decimal System of biblical languages. You know how if you, uh, if you have the Dewey Decimal System figured out, like, and you know it and how it works, you can find literally anything in a library, right? Right. Um, the same goes for Strong's numbers. 
so just as an example, like you don't have to know uh, Hebrew or Greek to be able to work in those languages. I mean, you're not, you're not going to be an expert at it, but you can do some good fundamental work in it. So if we go to, uh, in this case, looking it up uh, on the King James, you'd look up Badger, um, and you're going to find... A lot of instances of that in Strong's, um, all using, oh yeah, here we go, um, Strong's number for this word, Tahash, let me erase this, in the, in the list that Strong's gives you, he's going to show you where that English word appears in the scriptures. And next to each of those scripture citations, um, he's going to tell you what Hebrew or Greek word was translated into that English word. All right, so it's going to look something like this. So you've got, you know, badger. And you're going to have, you know, one from Exodus 25, verse 5. And he's going to give you the number... Uh, he'll also give you like a, a snippet of that verse where that word is used in English. Uh, but then over on the right, he's going to give you the number for that word. In this case, it is you know, it's 84 something. Yeah, 8476. And as you go through, he's got, you know, he lists the other places where you find it. And he will also list the Hebrew word that's used, that's translated that way in that passage. Uh, so that helps you find out where this word is being used in the scriptures. All right, because there are, like for example, um, we all know that there's like a lot of different Greek words for love. Right? So if you look up the word love in Strong's, you're going to get a lot of passages with a lot of different Greek words behind them. Um, and that's not necessarily going to help you out a whole lot, because you're dealing with lots and lots of different Greek words. Um, in this case, if you're looking at Badger, what you're going to find is a list of passages, and all of them are based off of this word, Strong's number 8476 in Hebrew, which is the hush. Uh, Strong's, by the way, is convinced that it's Badger. I mean, that's, he's kind of invested in that because he uses the King James. We'll explain why, like where he comes up with Badger, or where the King James came up with Badger in a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. So, if we look it up, uh, you'll find that it appears in Numbers 25, sorry, Exodus 25, 5, Exodus 26, 14, 35, 7, 35, 23, 3619, 3934, and then here in Numbers chapter 4, verses 6, 8, 10, 11, 12, 14, and 25. All right, you got all that, right? I'm not going to repeat it again. Um, now, there's one other passage, and we'll get to that in just a second. Um, and in all of those passages that I just listed out, it's that same word, tahash. Again, you don't have to know the Hebrew to be able to do this. You just have to be able to know, all right, here's the number that's being used. If it's used the same in every passage, it's the same Hebrew word. Um, and in every one of those passages, we are reading about the same thing. Uh, we are reading about this covering that is put on the tabernacle. All right, so we're not going to hunt down all of these passages, but just to take an example. You go to Exodus 25, verse 5. And we're going to see the same difference of translation here. Excuse me. Uh, and in fact, we're going to see even some, some more translation differences here in Exodus 25, 5. Uh, in the ESV, it reads, tanned ram's skins, goat skins, and acacia wood. All right, if you're reading this in the King James, it's something like ram skins dyed red, badger skins, and shetim wood. Uh, because they didn't translate the word shetim. Uh, it means acacia. Um, but focusing on just the, the badger skins part. 
again, in this context, it's about the covering of the tabernacle. And this doesn't really shed light on what's going on. If we look through all of those other passages in Exodus and in Numbers, we're going to discover the same thing. All of them are about this covering for the tabernacle, uh, and the text just tells us that you use the skin of the tahash, whether it's goat, badger, porpoise, whatever. Not particularly clarifying. Uh, there is one other place that Strong's tells us where this word appears. And it is in the prophet Ezekiel. Now that looks promising. While you're turning to Ezekiel chapter 16, let me just burst the bubble. It's not. But usually that's, that's a cause for excitement. All right, if you've got something that's confusing and it just keeps appearing in like a couple of contexts in, in the same text, like in Exodus and Numbers, but then you've got one reference like way off in the prophet somewhere, usually that's a, that's a pretty promising find. Um, because you can go you know, and have the prophets shed light on what's being talked about. Uh, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 16 is a... A fun chapter. It's a. It's essentially a, a fable. The Lord is telling Israel through the prophet Ezekiel about his finding of Israel, and he likens it to. Um, it, it fits into the bride metaphor that the Lord uses in a lot of the prophets. Um, we're not going to we're not going to read all of this in Ezekiel 16. Some of it is is kind of mature. Um, but if you go down to verse 10, one of the things that the Lord says that He does, well, like for example, we'll we'll, we'll go back to verse 9 because the Lord is telling about how He has taken care of Israel. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. All right, this sounds kind of like, it just in this one verse, it sounds kind of like the Good Samaritan, right? That he's found Israel abused and needy, and he's taken Israel in and taken care of her. In verse 10, I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with who knows what? With tahash. Yes, I shod you, and you know, I put shoes on your feet made out of, the ESV says, fine leather. All right, here the ESV is not exactly being consistent. Uh, it doesn't translate it goat skin here. It translates it fine leather. And that's a pretty common translation choice in some of the other versions. Um, but yeah, I put shoes on your feet made of badgers. Or I put shoes on your feet made of porpoise, uh, depending on what you're reading. It doesn't tell us much, just that whatever kind of leather this was, whatever kind of skin this was that was to be put over the tabernacle, is a material that would have been suitable for making shoes, for making sandals. Uh, which is why, like, if you read the, some of the revised, like the updated NIVs, they, like the NIV, when you read it, you can tell they just completely threw up their hands at Tahash. And they translate it like another durable leather it, whenever we're reading in Numbers chapter 4. Right? You cover it with a cloth of blue and some other leather. <laughs> and that's, that's basically the NIV solution. They just tell you up front, we have no idea what kind of leather this is. Um, but they note that it's durable. Because again, here in Ezekiel 16, it's something that you can make shoes out of. Not particularly enlightening. Doesn't really explain what the tahash is, but again, we now know at least the material would have been appropriate as a shoe leather. So, those are, those are all of the instances where it's used in the Old Testament. If you pull it up in Strong's, it's going to be, you've got several places in, in Exodus, uh, here in Numbers chapter 4, and then that one place in Ezekiel 16. Um, if, you were, if you were looking this up using a like a more sophisticated Hebrew language search, the only other instance of tahash in the Old Testament is in Genesis chapter 22, verse 24. 
and I'll burst the bubble before we turn there too. It has absolutely nothing to do with this skin because we read, let's see, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 20, no, that's, oh, I'm in 21. There we go. Yes, all right, so at the end of Genesis 22, let's start in verse 20. Now after these things, it was told to Abraham, Behold, Milcah, also his born children, to your brother Nahor. Uz, his firstborn, Buz, his brother, Kemuel, the father of Aram, Chesed, Hadzo, Fildash, uh, Yidlap, and Bethuel. Bethuel fathered Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. Uh, moreover, his concubine, so the concubine of Abraham's brother, Nahor, um, whose name was Ruma, she bore Tiva, Gaham, Tahash, and Maaka. So, whatever this animal is, there was some person in Abraham's family who was named after it. So, Abraham might have had a, a nephew named Badger. I don't know. Or Porpoise. Yeah. Or, le yeah, Leatherhead. Yeah. Yeah, Goat Boy. Um, his name was Tahash. All right, that's it. That's it for Tahash in the Old Testament. Uh, and we are no closer to knowing what it means. So what do you do if you're studying some other issue in the Old Testament and you don't know what this word or phrase means, it's confusing, and you've looked at all of the other places in the Old Testament where that same word or phrase is used, and you still have no idea what the text is talking about. Well, where you go from there um, is you start checking some of the ancient translations of the Old Testament. And that is less complex than it sounds. Okay, we're gonna, I'm going to try to put this on, on layman level. Like, you don't have to have any kind of expertise or knowledge in Greek or Hebrew or Latin or Aramaic to use these resources, uh, mainly because we've got a lot of information at our fingertips through the Internet. All right, you actually have the ability now. It, it, by the way, this is something that, I mean, how many people in history knew how to read? I mean, before, before the United States, I mean, very, very few. All right, all of us in here, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands if they don't know how to read. Right? I'm not going to embarrass anybody. Uh, I'm not going to call anybody a liar or anything. Um, but, you know, we all know how to read. How many people became scribes? You know, before the advent of, I mean, even the, the printing press, but especially before the internet, right? How many people had access to information um, and could actually do this kind of stuff? It was very, very rare. Very few people had access to this kind of stuff. We live in an incredible age uh, where y'all have access to all kinds of things that. You know, some really, some guy who would have been raised for this since he was like a little kid, who literally did nothing else, you know, was shut up in a room all day, every day, his whole life, reading and writing things, he would have killed to be able to have access to this kind of stuff. Um, because we have access to uh, these ancient translations of the Old Testament, um, where we can go through and like search stuff. Um, so what we're going to look at is a, um, after, after we've checked our, uh, our Old Testaments, what we're going to check is translations done, uh, ancient translations done in Greek, which you'll most often see abbreviated as LXX, uh, which stands for... Septuagint, it refers to the number 70, so the 70 translators that worked on this project. 
we're going to consider the Latin translation. Uh, the most common one that we have access to today, this is not the oldest one, but we've commonly got access to the Vulgate. And we're going to consider the Aramaic translations, which we call the Targumim. Uh, targumim is the plural form. The, the singular form is just Targum. T-A-R-G-U-M. That's the singular form. Um, now, we have access to uh, all of these on the Internet in forms that you can use. Again, you don't have to have any expertise in Greek, Latin, or Aramaic. Uh, maybe... <laughs> It, there, there's not great resources for translating the Greek, um, but the Aramaic, you can find English language translations of the Targumim. Um, you, uh, you can run the Vulgate through a, like a machine translator, which again, you can access for free um, and get a pretty decent English translation out of. These guys, the Greek and the English, uh, we've got access to, well here, let me, let me write it down here. We've got a couple of resources here. So besides Bible Hub uh, for Strong's, you should also check out Blue Letter Bible. And I don't remember if that's a .com or a .org. Let me look. Org. Now, if you were to get like a book copy of the Septuagint, it would run you, it's pretty expensive. And it's in Greek, so you wouldn't be able to read it anyway. Um, but you can access that for free on blueletterbible.org. Um, and it is, it's connected to um, like dictionaries and Strong's Concordance. So you can actually go through, it's kind of tedious to do this, but you can actually go through and like, you know, click on the link for each word and it'll take you to the dictionary for it. And you can piece together of a makeshift translation out of that. Um, so you can access the Septuagint on Blue Letter Bible. You can access the Vulgate on Blue Letter Bible. Uh, the Targumim, the Aramaic translations, there is another uh, there's another resource that you can use. These, they do all the work for you. If you go to targum.info, it is basically just a hangout for Targum scholars, uh, and they post like their translations of the Targum meme on there. Um, and so you can actually go and you can read an English translation of the Aramaic translation of big chunks of the Old Testament, all of, all of the Law of Moses, um, some of the prophets, and some of the writings. It's not the whole thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the reason why we would do this um, is because some of these translations, particularly the Septuagint, the Greek translations, uh, they are very, very old translations. So in the case of the Septuagint, uh, that Greek translation is actually older than the oldest copy of the Hebrew manuscripts that we have for our Old Testament. So the Hebrew that we use, we call the Masoretic text, and the oldest copies that we have of that date to about 1000 A.D., Right, which is pretty late. Uh, we've, we've also got the Dead Sea Scrolls. They date a lot earlier, um, and they are almost identical to the Masoretic text. Um, but the, the Septuagint is considerably older than the Masoretic text. So you're looking at, uh, this is what um, Greek-speaking Jews, uh, this is how they understood uh, the text of the Old Testament that they had, right? So these, 
these 70 that the word Septuagint refers to, um, they would have been sitting down with their Hebrew copies of the Hebrew Scriptures, translating from Hebrew into Greek. And so what that tells you is, this is what, you know, whenever you read that Greek translation, that's their understanding of what the Hebrew meant. And so whenever you come across something that nowadays we have no idea what it means, maybe sometime, you know, we're, we're talking over 2,000 years ago, uh, maybe somebody still knew what that meant back then. And so that's why you would check these translations. Um, because they might know something that has been lost to history and lost to us. Uh, and you do a little bit of comparing. And if you, have, if you have these ancient translations line up on something, uh, then that's a pretty good indicator that that's what the Hebrew meant. And that for whatever reason, uh, we've just lost that understanding over the course of the last 2,000 years. So, let's have a look at what the ancient versions say. For this issue, I've done the work for you today. And I've done the translating, too. Again, with the Vulgate, you would need to like plug it into Google Translate. <clears throat> but Google actually does a pretty good job translating Latin. For the Targums, you've got that English translation available to you already. For the Septuagint, that's, that's where you have to do a little work. Alright, so up at the top, all right, so this is six different translations of Numbers chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, the first two are the ESV and the King James. The third one uh, is, excuse me, this is basically, this is the Caleb Adkisson version uh, translated from, uh, like directly from the Hebrew. So, where it says Masoretic text, um, I have translated that from Hebrew into English. It kind of reads like this, and they put on it a covering of tahash skin and spread out a holy blue garment on top of it, and they shall set its poles. All right, at the bottom, those last three translations, those are the ancient translations. We've got the Septuagint, the Vulgate, and the Targumim. <coughs> and all of them agree. And here's the surprising thing. To the ancient translators, this is not an animal. Let's read through these translations. All right, uh, this, is, this is my translation from the Greek. It's kind of rough. They shall lay on it a covering, oh, sorry, a covering hyacinthine hyas uh, skin. Hyacinthine is actually a word uh, that uh, the, the English word hyacinth actually comes from Greek. I didn't know this before I started studying this, but hyacinth is a Greek word. Um, a hyacinthine skin, so a skin that looks like hyacinth. And they shall spread on that another garment, holy hyacinthine, and they shall set in the bearing poles. All right, the Latin reads almost exactly the same way. They shall spread over it a cloth holy of blue and cover it again with a cover of violet skins and put in the bars. So the main difference there is that in the Latin, they've changed the order of things. Right? The cloth goes on first, then the skins. In every other translation, it's been the skins first, then the cloth. Uh, the Targumim, the Aramaic, uh, reads, And put over it a covering of hyacinthine skins, and overspread it with a wrapper, holy purple, having inset its staves. All right, so our Greek translators, our Latin translator, and our Aramaic translators all understand tahash not to be an animal, but a color, which is weird. Uh, which is why, for example, Dewey Rames, uh, that's not exactly a modern English translation. It's a common English translation. Uh, Dewey Rames reads violet skins. Uh, it, it's not on the handout. Um, 
because it's taking its cues from the ancient Greek and ancient Latin. So, what our ancient translators thought was, now this is actually blue or purple. It has nothing to do with an animal. We have no idea what animal it's made out of. It would kind of make sense in light of Exodus 25.5. Um, you remember, we looked there earlier, and the, I think the ESV said something like tanned ram skins, a covering of goat skin, and acacia wood. Where the King James said uh, ram skins dyed red, which is a little closer to the Hebrew. Right? It's, uh, it's ram skins made red, or reddened. Um, and in light of that, this kind of makes sense, right? That God might be telling Moses not just what animal it's made out of, but how they are to dye all of the cloths and all of the skins. That you dye some of the ram skins red, you dye some of these other skins purple, you know, deep blue, uh, and that's what you're going to use. Now, again, it doesn't wholly settle the issue, but that does indicate that the... The question, like the disagreement that we have today over, well, is it a porpoise or is it a badger, would have been completely unintelligible to our ancient readers. All right, now, the last things that you look at after you would look at these kinds of things uh, is you start considering, uh, usually your Hebrew lexicons will tell you about this, uh, and your concordances will tell you about this or commentaries that you read would tell you about this. But if you're still at a place where you really can't figure out what a word or a phrase means, uh, then you would start looking at what we call cognate languages, so languages that are related to Hebrew. Uh, so the other main, like the other major uh, Semitic language that we still have today is Arabic. Right, Arabic and Hebrew are cousin languages. Um, and so a lot of people speculate, by the way, this is where we get porpoise and dolphin. A lot of people speculate that Tahash is related to a very, very similar Aramaic, where, not Aramaic, Arabic word that means dolphin or porpoise. Um, and that's where some of our translators have gotten porpoise or dolphin, so that's why the New, the New American Standard uses porpoise, because that's the Arabic word for dolphin. Um, there is, there's a problem with that that we'll get to in a minute. Uh, there's, let's see, uh, there's a similar Egyptian word that just means fine leather, which is why a lot of our translations read fine leather. Uh, there's, a, there's an Akkadian word that, again, is very similar to, to hush that just describes... And, uh, an orange or yellow color, um, and leather dyed with that color. Which, again, doesn't tell us much because all of our other trans ancient translators think that it's purple or blue, not yellow or orange. Other things you can check. Um, there are a lot of rabbinic commentaries. On this issue, the rabbis have no idea. They're all over the place. Uh, one... So they, you call rabbinic commentaries, well, you've got a couple of sets. You've got Talmud, which is older, generally, and you have Midrash, which is newer, but generally better quality. Um, but the, the Midrash for numbers, um, the rabbi that wrote that thinks that the animal that was used for, so the, the tahash, the animal whose skin was used for this, um, was a species of badger that was actually rendered extinct because of the tabernacle. That Moses literally hunted this animal out of existence to build the tabernacle. Where he gets that, I have no idea. But that is why your King James and your new King James says badger. Because... The Midrash Bamidbar, so the commentary on numbers, was written very shortly before the King James translation was done and would have been known in Europe uh, when King, the King James translators were working. So they come across this term, they have no idea what it means, they get hold of whatever commentaries they've got on it, and one of them is Midrash Bamidbar, 
and this guy says it's actually a badger that doesn't exist anymore. And so it's badger skins. Let's see. The now that that doesn't leave our ESV in a particularly good place because they have they've basically just made up goat skin. There's absolutely no no reason for thinking it's a goat over anything else. It would frankly be better to do something like the ES or the the RSV or the no no the NRSV uh, or the NIV where they just say some kind of leather. It's good leather, whatever it is. Durable, Durable leather, yeah. Um, so, we got a couple of things that are just flat out made up. Badgers and goats. We've got something that at least has some basis, in fact, and that is porpoise. Uh, the Red Sea does have porpoises. The Bedouins living around the Red Sea do hunt porpoises for their skins and make clothes out of them. But there is one problem with the porpoise. And this is where, again, Scripture, you let Scripture answer Scripture first. And this is where the translators of the New American Standard uh, should, have, should have realized that porpoise would not have worked. Go to Leviticus chapter 11. What do we read about in Leviticus chapter 11? Yeah, clean and unclean animals. Verse 9. These you may eat of all that are in the waters, everything in the waters that has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers you may eat. But anything in the seas or the rivers that does not have fins and scales, of the swarming creatures in the waters and of the living creatures that are in the waters, is detestable to you. You shall regard them as detestable. You shall not eat any of their flesh, and you shall detest their carcasses. All right, so it's not just a matter of diet. They are wholly unclean. All right, you're not supposed to touch them, let alone skin them, let alone cover the tabernacle in their skins. All right, and what's a porpoise? I, I didn't ask that at the beginning. Anybody know what a porpoise is? It, it's basically a dolphin. Yeah, it is a mammal. It has fins, but it does not have scales. It's unclean. Uh, and in fact, if you were to look at like a kosher food list, they would tell you even today, dolphin and porpoise are not kosher. Don't eat it. Um, and they would point to this passage. So it can't be porpoise. Sorry, New American Standard. Not porpoise. Sorry, ESV. You've got no reason for thinking it's goat. But those are some tools that you can use to hunt down. I, I get, a lot of the stuff that you see in the Old Testament is not like, like this is obviously kind of obscure and not exactly useful, right? To hosh. But the methods that you use in hunting down an answer, those are useful. And there are plenty of places in the Old Testament where you're going to run into a roadblock or into a brick wall and you're going to say, how on earth do I tackle this? And that's the process. So, uh, any questions or comments before we wrap it up tonight? All right, well, thank you so much for your kind attention this evening. We want to extend the invitation to anybody who is here who is in need. There are things in this world that matter much more than the skin of the Tahash, like your eternal soul. And the question is, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? If you are in need to repent of your sins, confess His name, and be baptized into His death, burial, and resurrection, we stand ready. If you are in any other need, we stand ready. Make your need known by coming forward as together we stand and sing.